would like to tell you about the strangest secret in the world. Some years ago, the late Nobel Prize winning Dr. Albert Schweitzer was being interviewed in London, and a reporter asked him, Doctor, what's wrong with men today? And the great doctor was silent a moment, and then he said, Men simply don't think. Hello, I'm Lynn Kitchen, and I am so excited to present to you today a very, very special guest, my friend, Pamela Nightingale. Hi, Pamela. Hi. I'm so Hi. happy that you are here today. So am I, honey. We are going to rock the house with a new tribute to amazing Earl Nightingale, your father. Yes, we are. And this is such a pleasure for me because I am, I'm, I am the biggest fan of Earl Nightingale, who we now call not just the Dean of Personal Development, but the father of personal development. Thank because you. everything that has ever come from uh, his, his work and his time in the industry, uh, it all points back to his wisdom, to his, um, his, his just his gravitas and everything that he taught us along the way. So I'm just yes, so, yeah. so delighted. We're going to talk a little bit about you and your father and your life with him. And then we're going to reserve some time for questions and answers because everybody Wonderful. has their questions for you. Thank you. You've carried mm -hmm. his message. And every time you see something on the media that you feel does not serve his message well, you correct people. I do. <laughs> and I like that about you because um, Earl Nightingale's real legacy is, is something that we all should know correctly. Yeah, we should know it correctly. And believe me, when I do correct people, it's totally without any filters. <laughs> well, well, I know you say it like it is, and I love that about you. One of the Thank things you. that I'd love to say is that Earl Nightingale um, really dates back to the 1950s when he got his start. And mm -hmm. uh, he became one of the best known radio personalities, mm -hmm. and then a motivational speaker in his own yes. right. And he mm -hmm. had one of the largest syndicated national radio shows of all international. time. International. International. And, and became a household name. My own mother remembers listening to Earl Nightingale on WGN radio oh, yes. uh, every week. And she she was the one who told me that it was named Our Changing World. World. Mm -hmm. And she remembers listening to his voice, which mm -hmm. always woke her up. Um, and it resonates. She, it resonates. It mm -hmm. really does. And one mm -hmm. thing that she told me that she'll never forget, at the end of every broadcast, he would acknowledge his lovely and loving wife. Mary. And I want you to know how special that is because she said at the time he is he was the first person professionally who would even acknowledge that that they had a, a wife or that they had a relationship and a happy one at home. They had a beautiful love story because when they met on the beach when they were sixteen in on Long Beach, California. My father became aware that she did have a heart condition and that she was not supposed to live very long and not have children. But he loved her so deeply and with his whole heart, mind, and body that he didn't care. Well, and I, I, I absolutely agree that uh, the book that you are now representing, and let's just, yeah. just Let's mm -hmm. right away say the very exciting book that you have right mm -hmm. now is the story of Earl Nightingale and his strangest secret. Mm -hmm. And I think it is not only a history of his life, but it's a love story. It is a love story. And she was so positive minded and she came from such a lovely, wonderful, positive family that she did have my older brother and she had me. And, Which was a uh, miracle. Yeah. A miracle well, anyway, of... it's a miracle. But with her, it really, it was 
break because um, it did not give her any heart problems at the time. But my father took excellent care of my mother. He did. And she had the best care of any cardiologist, you know, in Chicago or in the United States. And, and it's a beautiful love story. It's a great book. What do you think of the book, Elaine? I love the book. Now, we're yeah. talking about this book. You are bringing it out as an audio book first. Yes. And then the printed book is, is on its way. We're all looking forward to that. But the mm -hmm. audio book was so exciting to hear um, mm -hmm. because it is, you know, first of all, uh, the story about the voice, the man mm -hmm. with the voice. So mm -hmm. how fitting would it could it be to have an audio book about Earl it Nightingale, the most famous voice that we've ever had and probably in the last 40, 50 years, no one like mm -hmm. him. No, he has his voice was so piercing and memorable that we would that when we would dine out in restaurants, I'd have to order for him because otherwise people would be coming over to our table, chasing the voice, <laughs> chasing the voice because that's yeah. what they heard. They chase the voice. Well, before we uh, go any further, let's just acknowledge the fact that his voice made him famous in yeah. the, the the probably the most famous recording of all time uh called Strangest the secret. strangest secret yeah so your audiobook is the story behind the story mm -hmm. of yes strangest it is secret and mm -hmm. that was what was so exciting to hear is all mm -hmm. of the backstories behind this the strangest secret but I, let me just tell the audience that the strangest secret was the number one recorded voice recording uh, record at the time recorded in 1957. And we'll get into the story behind this in just a second. Yeah, it's the only recorded record that's ever gone platinum. Ever Point gone eight. platinum. And I know yeah. it went gold first, which meant that it mm -hmm. sold over 1 million copies, but then yeah. went platinum. And I don't mm -hmm. know how many millions that represents. I don't either. It went <laughs> platinum sometime and then I believe in the 90s. Isn't that interesting? Why? Is because it's timeless. And that's the one thing why I believe that Earl Nightingale's uh, reputation and uh, who he stands for is continuing today to even be more popular. Because know, The Strangest because Secret is thing, more popular now even than it was 10 years ago or 20 it's a years time, ago. It's timeless. And it's very... It's a beautiful, beautiful recording, and I listen to it occasionally because um, it really is timeless because most of the people that are buying it today don't know my father is deceased. That is probably true. People feel like he's mm -hmm. so alive and present because his voice mm -hmm. is alive and present in the now. Well, he always wanted to, he told me he wanted to leave a legacy like Pluto, you know, all the great philosophers at the time. And um, he was really, that was important to leave a legacy. And when he found out that his life was going to be 10 years shorter, it was very important to leave, you know, like a beautiful legacy. And he did. He did. One, one of the ways that people leave a legacy is through relationships. So I want to mm -hmm. just take a moment, Pamela, to acknowledge you and your relationship with your father. You know, father-daughter relationships are very, very special bonds, mm -hmm. very special bonds. And the fact that yeah. you are here to carry on that legacy is, mm -hmm. is I think, one of the, the sweetest things that we, can, that we can celebrate. Well, it's an honor and it's a great privilege. Um, I feel honored and grateful to have had the parents I did have. And I feel truly blessed and to, at the, Believe me, at the time when I was very young, I didn't know how great he was mm -hmm. until we started really traveling together. And then I just became, I'm a, a daddy's girl. What can I say? <laughs> well, you he, were you were actually his um, a traveling companion and yes. took care of him. I know that he had quite a an illness mm -hmm. that took someone to, to for he had to care. Tell, say Which that word is, again. Acromegaly. My father had acromegaly, which is giantism. He was a big guy, a very big man. So that and means that the growth hormones didn't yeah. didn't, didn't stop. So he continued no, see, to grow. No, they removed the tumor from the pituitary gland, 
But agromegaly, it doesn't quit there. It continues to release growth hormone. So he had to have three hip replacements, two shoulder replacements. The man liked to play golf. And then he had two heart valve replacements. No, it was, he was on his third heart valve replacement when he passed away. I see. And uh, you just have to keep having things replaced. And the reason I would travel with him was to make sure that he didn't have another brain tumor headache and to make sure I could get his shoes put on him because, you know, he couldn't go out black tie without shoes on and to make sure he didn't have a problem with his health. And also it was too much fun not to travel with him. It was I mean, too much I fun to, not to travel with him. Well, that's really a, that is the one area too that we want. I just want everyone to know how much fun Earl Nightingale. He was so much fun. That man was fun. He would, he worked just, he worked hard, but then he played hard too. And a lot of the audio books is about the amount of fun that he mm -hmm. had in his life. He had a presence about him that was so positive and wonderful. And I never really thought that he would die of anything because he had this mind over matter attitude where I didn't think anything could kill that man. I didn't because he believed in heal thyself. You know, that philosophy of healing yourself. And he was such a positive man. I just didn't think anything would hurt him. You know, that he, he represents that mind over matter. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I remember in your audio book, you pointed out mm -hmm. that it, I think he was at the age of 29 when he first read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and decided mm -hmm. that, uh, what, uh, that what we think uh, whatever we do think we can do and that thoughts That's become a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he probably single-handedly helped Napoleon Hill popularize that book. Mm -hmm. um, once again. I don't know. I was very young at that time. I do remember meeting him as a child, Napoleon Hill. But um, no, my father, that book, Napoleon Hill was my father's mentor. Mm-hmm. So that is that is just extraordinary because most of the quotes that we can find, mm -hmm. the quotes by Earl Nightingale, um, mm -hmm. they, they will live on forever because they make oh, you yeah. feel so good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We become what we think about. We, we truly become do. what we think about. And one of the things that he really represented was how you can change your life by your thoughts. You can. He wasn't can. born successful. No, he wasn't born. Uh, you can, this, no one's this born successful personality. No, my father. Um, he, you know, he was brought up during the, you know, the Great Depression, and uh, he just he noticed on his paper route the difference between the haves and the have-nots, and the haves have choices. The have-nots don't, and because they have choices, the haves are happier than the have-nots. And um, he went, you know, he went to war, war pondering that thought. And then after Pearl Harbor, uh, he, uh, he changed his mind about his career goals. And he wanted to go into the radio business. And the hub at that time was in downtown Chicago. And so he went and applied there for three positions. He got hired at all three. And so he decided to do the Sky King. Now, let's back up just a second, because you mentioned Pearl Harbor, and in the audio book, which is mm -hmm. extraordinary detail of mm -hmm. uh, a really heroic, heroic history that most of us did, does, we don't know that about Earl Nightingale. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of Earl Nightingale, the Marine? Well, my father joined the Marines when... I believe he lied about his age. He was born in 21, 1921, and he self-educated himself so extensively that he scored highly. And then he was so physically fit because he was a lifeguard on the beach, you know, in Long Beach. And they, he was accepted into the Marines. And he was a Marine for, I think, a couple of years prior to 1941. And then... That was a terrible day in my dad's life, a very bad day. But he did live that day, and but he saw some horrible things. So he horrible was things. on the USS Arizona. Arizona. 
Yeah. As it was one of the 15 Marine survivors that lived that day, that survived that day, actually. It's not a subject my father would talk about, but I did get this much, is that he followed the pipeline without, with Alan Chapley, and, my, and Alan Chapley actually really saved my dad's life. But uh, from Johnny, and then toward the end of the, he helped Alan, they got to the beach finally, and my dad was just hit through Chap Road here, and that's it. But he did live that day, and then he um, he wrote to the president about that day. And I read the letter at the Smithsonian. I was with my brother David, and it was pretty graphic. It was a horrific day, not a special day. And he wouldn't talk about it to us very much, but he did have night horrible nightmares. About it. Oh, yeah. Yes. But then, you know, as life does, it moves forward mm -hmm. and he moved on and married mm -hmm. your mother and had mm -hmm. two beautiful children. Yes, he did. And I remember hearing in your audiobook that one of the things that he decided that he wanted was an goal setting and success, you know, the way he be began to think that you could create your own uh, future yes. mm -hmm. was that he put a goal for himself that he wanted to be a millionaire by the age of 35. Now, a millionaire back then is probably mm -hmm. equivalent to 10 million today in terms of uh, okay. well, inflation and so forth. Goal. He made that goal by writing The Strangest Secret. That's what I wanted to ask you about. So mm -hmm. that goal I... actually occurred by means of the one thing that he wrote or recorded, and he didn't even wasn't even aware uh, right, we, of the importance was, of that recording. He was taking David and I sailing for the summer, and um, he asked Jane Munsell, his um, office manager, she, they told her that he was going, and she said, would you please leave a recording of, for motivating the staff of my of his insurance company? He said, okay. Okay, and so, so he hold on, on right there. What that means is that at that time, he then had his own insurance company yeah. and a staff of salespeople for mm -hmm. which he motivated and, and gave motivational speeches weekly mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. to help them uh, oh, get yes, motivated. Everybody. And so when he went off to vacation with you and your, your brother. He left, he left the recording of The Strange Secret. He left this recording behind. 40 uh, in, copies. He 40 made 40 copies co for each mm -hmm. one of the salesmen to. And then his have. wife or, or a special partner, you know. And then we went sailing. We were gone about eight weeks. Gone. Bye weeks. bye. Bye. <laughs> and then it went, it became quite popular when we were gone. So you, you know, were off was, sailing the world and he had no clue that. No. That what was really going on back in the United States, because you mm -hmm. were off in the Bahamas and so forth with no ship to shore radio. Yeah, um, we went to the Caribbean and the West Indies. Yeah, yeah, it was great. And when you came back to Miami or, or Fort Lauderdale, Fort or whatever, Lauderdale. I forgot, Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. you were barraged with a group of uh, uh, media, yeah. radio people and TV people and so forth. Ask, saying, where's Earl Nightingale? Where's Earl Nightingale? Because in the meantime, this yeah. record went crazy all over. It did. Like, it's crazy. like going, it's like today's, um, you know. Uh, it went viral. I viral. Guess it, today, um, <laughs> it went viral. viral. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we got back, there are all these people. I remember at the time I was very young, but I just remember cameras flashing. And... Uh, my father had no idea, so he said, am I about to be arrested? <laughs> he thought he, he was know. in trouble or something with the well, law. Well, he didn't know. Mm -hmm. But it was great. And I was very young, so I don't recall ever listening to The Stranger Secret at the time. I think they ran out of copies, actually. <laughs> but um, it was it became quite popular while we were out of town. I love it's the story. Fact, yeah, as a matter of fact, in the, I think it was in the Chicago Tribune, it was... Where there was a headline, where are the nightingales? We were that's, gone. Yeah, that's right. Because you were, you were you were absent. Nobody could yeah. find you, which made the mystery and even my mother, more exciting. And my mother was in Arizona. So our housekeeper was answering the phone. <laughs> and they said Mrs. Nightingale's out of town. And you know, she was she would not give out her number ever. 
that would be a big no-no in our house, you know. So my mother didn't even know what was going on. But isn't it interesting that a one recording, which is only what thirteen minutes long, mm-hmm. or longer, that a was bit. that went public um, on a record player at the time. We had to use those record players, little baby record forty-five little, thing, little baby record players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and everybody wanted one. Oh, well, it it someone dropped the copy of the WGN. So then it went crazy. They kept playing it, you know. So but, the radio station kept playing it, and so people yeah. kept ordering it. And, and then it got along. And then it got onto the our changing world thing. I don't know. It went crazy. And it was really fun because he did meet his goal. He made he was very successful by the age he was thirty five. So by the fact that he made a thirteen minute recording, which went mm-hmm. global went viral Mm -hmm. and made his goal of Mm -hmm. being a a millionaire by the age of 35, but he didn't stop there. No, he became, and then he, then he joined forces with Floyd Conant and they started Nightingale Conant Corporation. Nightingale Conant Corporation became the largest distributor of motivational material Mm -hmm. for sales Mm -hmm organizations and corporations mm-hmm. worldwide and they still mm-hmm. are and mm-hmm. one one of the number one companies in the world for that and so mm-hmm. he became a partner of that corporation mm-hmm. and built that's why we call him the father of personal development yep. industry mm-hmm. <laughs> so i just wanted to ask you as a daughter being a daughter of this magnificent mm-hmm. man Mm-hmm. What is the one thing that you feel is his most endearing quality that you loved the most about him? Um, his most endearing quality to me was that if he was alive, I felt safe in the world because that man had the strength to do anything in my life, to make it right. Mm-hmm. He was, And he was so protective of me and I think yeah, of me, that when he was alive, I felt safe in the world, always. And that's true. That. Mm-hmm. Because he, he, he just made things happen that fixed everything for me. Mm-hmm. I, love I remember, that. I remember when I was very young, I was, I was in a horse show, I think, and I, no, I was in a riding lesson. And there was a lot of mud, and my horse slipped. I was thrown. I heard my arm break. My mother was called to meet it. She came and picked me up from the stable. I kept saying, Mom, I heard my arm break. I went to the doctor. The doctor said, Oh, no, Mrs. Nightingale, her arm's not broken because it's not discolored or it's not out of place. I kept saying, I heard it break, but he didn't have an x ray machine. So my dad got home that night. I couldn't stop crying and uh, because I was in so much pain. I said, Daddy, my arm's broken. I heard it break. So he drove an hour to an x-ray machine, uh, to a hospital that had one. And so he took me in there and the doctor said, oh, no, Mr. Rang, it's not broken. It's not. And my dad took him, threw him against the wall. And he said, my daughter said she heard her arm break. You x-ray that her arm now. He was afraid of my dad at that point, of course. And he said, oh, Mr. Nightingale, I'm so sorry, but your daughter's arm is broken in three places. Ooh. So he cast on my arm, finally. So we get on back. Oh, my dad was driving his new Cadillac blue car, baby blue Cadillac. So finally we got home. And um, the next day, you know, the pain went away immediately. You know, housekeeper made me my favorite dinner. Cornish game, hands wild rice, asparagus, the hollandaise sauce, and um, German chocolate cake. So the next day, I get this huge bouquet from my dad, like three feet bouquet. And in the bouquet was a little jewel box. And I opened it up from Harry Winston. He gave me a horse, a little horse, because I couldn't ride for eight weeks. And that's how powerful that man. He did not like you to say no. Uh uh-uh. uh. If you said no to my dad, 
you better run. And that's just the way he was. I felt safe when that man was alive in the world, believe me. Mm -hmm. Well, I really love that story. And you know, your audio book is filled full of stories. Mm -hmm. Story after story after story. Was I funny. was laughing and then I was crying and I was laughing mm -hmm. and crying. And one of the stories mm -hmm. I remember uh, that I liked was actually you were quite young and mm -hmm. he taught you that you could do anything. Oh, what the fuck, Peter could, Pan thing? That you, you're, um, you- I could fly? Yeah, you could fly. And the you Peter decided, Pan. Oh. Peter Pan story. He, oh my yeah, God. He, he said, you can do anything that you set your mind to. And so I think you said you were like five years old, maybe six. Uh, and yeah, you my decided you me. could be Peter Pan. Yeah, my parents took me down downtown to Chicago to see the live performance of Peter Pan. And I came home and my dad had always, I had been raised with the belief that if you believe you can do something and you believe it 100% then you can do it. So I tried to fly off the piano, that didn't work. Then I tried out the second floor window, that didn't work. And then when we were in, in New Orleans, tried again, the lantern and the chandelier, my dad finally realized my problem was I didn't have pixie dust. And then I stopped trying. And so me, I just gave my gave mother. You, he gave you pixie dust. No, he said I didn't have any pixie dust. That's why I couldn't fly. It wasn't because I didn't think I, I didn't believe enough that I could. It's because I didn't have any pixie. And then I stopped trying. <laughs> so cute. But that's just one of the cuter stories. And some of the other stories about mm -hmm. the famous people that uh, Earl Nightingale attracted. Because as you said, he was like a magnet. Uh, mm -hmm. to not only yeah. famous people, but powerful people. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it, in one of the pictures on the back cover of your new book is a picture of, of uh, Earl Nightingale meeting the Queen of England. Oh, yeah. She and, really liked his radio show, the, Our Changing World. You know that one. She really liked that. The Queen and of he England did liked it, liked her, he his show. Yeah, and he also did a great work, deal of work, you know, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, all those places. He did a lot of work there. And she really, he came home and said, well, Pam, she must have really liked my radio show because she said she listened to it. So that was wonderful. Yes, it is wonderful. But mm -hmm. very few people know that he was not only a philanthropist, but he did a lot of work around the world. Very, very well known in countries like Australia mm -hmm. um, and uh, countries oh, yes. around the world that uh, listened mm -hmm. to his show even more than Americans. So he was more famous internationally at a certain yes. period, point in, in he, his life. His radio show was translated into a lot of languages, a lot. Like, Plus his books, mm -hmm, the number yes. of books that he wrote mm -hmm, was, a, was definitely a, like six or eight books too mm -hmm. that he wrote, which is an extraordinary life mm -hmm. of achievement. He wrote, I believe he wrote "Lead the Field" um, right after Nightingale Conant started, mm -hmm. and then he wrote. You know, he wrote so many great books. He did. He was a great guy, and he they're all so in publishing it and being read again, just like this. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. recording of the of the greatest secret mm -hmm. because as we mentioned before it's a timeless timeless um yes uh, motivation for mm -hmm. what is it that we can do to achieve our goals and our dreams yes, yes. is there anything in at, 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 right before we close and ask for questions for you because i know the people have lots of questions for you mm -hmm. is there anything that you'd like to share about my dad and me mm -hmm. and my relationship. Um, or about just, your book, uh, uh, your new book, uh, that's, by oh, the way, available on Amazon, the book. audio book. I, feel, I felt at the time that it needed to be done before it became too late for me in my life to do it, you know. Um, and during the pandemic, it was a perfect time because lockdown, you know? Right. So I did the book be, because he deserves it. He does. If anyone deserves to be honored by his daughter, he does. We are especially proud and happy to have so many people that are 
um, welcoming you, Pamela. Thank you so much for being who you are in the world. Yes. You know, it's, you. it's just an honor and pleasure. And I'm just going to get right to the questions if it's okay with you. Follow me. All right. Well, the first question we have comes from uh, Hane. My friend Hane. Hi, Hane. Great to have you here. Where did uh, Earl Nightingale get his energy and vision to do all that he did? What a great question. Thank you. As a child, uh, he had a, his, his mother, my grandmother, gave him a little red wagon and he would take it to the library. And he started reading at the beginning with the great philosophers. And then he moved from there and they gave him so much drive. And he wanted to do something amazing with his life. He didn't know what at that time. But I think it was from his early days of education. I could not find a record of him ever graduating from high school because I believe back then due to the magnitude of that big earthquake when he was 12, I think things kind of got really decimated in the school system and um, he self-educated himself, he did. And I think it came from the, his, from that, from his, from his exploring in the library. Interesting. And, you know, that is a personal self-drive. Yeah. Which is, is. Um, I think that's what he stands for. He, he went from rags to riches, but the one thing is you mentioned, he uh, was in the library the whole time, self-educating and making sure that he absolutely. Um, he, he, something I thought came to me just now. He told me when I was very young, he loved, and he told my brother David too, he loved the, he loved anything by Jules Verne, the, you know, those great <laughs> books. He loved reading Mark Twain as a young boy. And I think it was the adventures of both that kind of also gave him the desire for adventure. And maybe that's why he ultimately, well, I think there's a lot of factors of why he joined the Marines, because I think they came after, they came to Long Beach after, you know, that big earthquake for aid, to give aid to the people. But I think one of the reasons that he really had never been out of California before, and he wanted some adventure. <laughs> Why reading. not? Yeah. Um, he loved reading a great deal. And he had amazing memory, too. He did. Absolutely. He, in fact, I read that he had, or maybe in your audiobook, it said he has a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Anne, here's another question I'd like to. So, Anne asks What is something that no one knows about your father? This is a great question that no one knows about your father, only your family that maybe you could share with us. I'll bet something like that is in your audio book. No, it's not in there. <laughs> um, you know, he had a bit of a sense of humor. That man did. Okay. He could, I don't know if I should say this or not, but if dad, uh, I could be, we had a lot of tournaments at our house during the winter months, like bongo board, unicycle, chess, bridge, anything, ping pong during the winter months. And I was in a bank go ball tournament once and all the kids kept going and going and going on and on and on. And my father, five o'clock, had to have a cocktail, a martini time. And so he, like a ventriloquist, that man could throw sounds across the room. Well, he made it sound like breaking wind. Everybody laughed and I won the tournament. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, well, that's something only the family would know. I mean, well, I guess so. That 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 counts right there. I hope that yeah, you know, an an answers your question, Anne. Mm -hmm. Um here's a question from James. He mm -hmm. asked, was Earl Nightingale the first? guru or motivational speaker prior was that before tony robbins oh definitely tony robbins is younger than i am i think tony robbins is probably 10 or more years younger than i am he's the first <laughs> motivational speaker i knew of course but oh, tony yeah. robbins did visit my dad in chicago i sort of remember meeting him i did meet him i believe I was young then too, and so was Tony. He must have been 
maybe 20, 25, and I was 35. Well, yeah, I was younger then, but um, I don't know of anyone else. I know after he started Nightingale Conan, Wayne Dyer started public speaking. That's right. And then, of course, Bob Proctor worked for him and with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then a friend of mine uh, uh, also worked with your father um, and uh, who's still alive today. I'm trying to think of, of his name, Ben Gay III, who may be yeah. on the show here. Um, but here's a, you know, it's interesting that we're we're doing a retrospective, almost like a history, but Earl Nightingale was probably the first modern, real uh, motivational speaker that was on the radio. Mm -hmm. And that's what popularized uh, motivational speaking, not only because of his voice, but also because he was available on syndicated national radio, which really? at the time was a huge big deal. Before television, radio was everything. I know. So that made him, I think, uh, so pervasive. Here's a really great question. Pamela, what is the greatest thing? Actually, I've seen this question asked by two people so far in the chat. Uh, what is the greatest thing that your dad taught you? He taught, well, love he, that question. First of all, to be, have a great moral compass. By the age of 12, he made sure that I had developed in my other brother moral compasses. And then he later on in life, he said, be true to yourself, be it, have great. Um, he said, never work for anybody else but yourself because you only, no, the, uh, he, the first thing before that he taught me, never be a follower, never follow the follower, set trends, don't follow trends. I learned that was in high school. And then later You were a trendsetter, right? Well, uh, maybe a little bit back then. I don't know if I was. I had my own sense of style for sure. And he said, oh, and another thing, he said, do the opposite of what most people are doing because most people are followers. Um, here's a question from Mimi. Hi, Mimi. Uh, pleasure to meet you, Pamela. Do you feel pressured as a child? while knowing your father was a successful man among, uh, among so many, from your perspective, what kind of expectation did your father have with you, about you, for you? Well, he had no, you mean, as far as a career line? I don't know what she means, what Mimi yeah. means here, but from your perspective, did was it a lot of pressure? Uh, uh, did he place some expectation upon you? Standard for women. Mm -hmm. Women did not have to go out and be the breadwinners in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Oh no, I think the only pressure that was put on me, I put on myself, was to win my horse shows. Mm -hmm. Because my dad got me great horses. He did. But no, um, no, I think I was never under any pressure. Um, to do something great in my life because of the double standard he had in his mind for women. Then, you know, later in life that changed. I had my own business that I started in 84, 1984, I started my own business that I had for almost 30 years in Carmel, California, because that was a personal goal of mine. I had to be successful in my own life doing something, but he never made me feel any pressure to do anything. No, knowledge was the greatest gift he gave me was the, he gave me the joy of knowledge and the desire for more knowledge. That's what he gave me. Now, well, that's fitting because he was a, a, a voracious reader and, and uh, he felt that education would pull you out by your bootstraps. And he also, you know, from my readings, um, uh, said that anyone can do anything that they put their mind to. Yes. And when we talk about, there's a question here for, uh, from James who said that he's interested in where uh, Earl Nightingale fits in the history of the progression. Uh, for example, was he younger or no, older than Zig Ziglar? Did Zig Ziglar come later? Did What about Dale Carnegie? We've already talked about Tony Robbins, who was much younger. 
But what about Dale Carnegie and... Um, I don't know their ages off the top of my head. Richard, Richard? Zig Ziglar perhaps probably was um, a decade later yeah. in, my, in my view. Napoleon Hill, was Napoleon Hill was older than my dad. Dale Carnegie is older than my dad. And I think, oh yeah, he was, they were friends. And Zig Ziglar was a friend of my dad too. I met him at the house too. And I met one night at the house. You probably met a lot of, of the famous people who became famous later. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've, I've read, and in your book, you mentioned that uh, your father uh, as a part of the Nightingale Conan, was very, very instrumental in bringing Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, back into the mainstream. Of course, it was written before, mm -hmm. and he, and that your father read it as a young man at the age of, uh, you know, 29, or maybe it was even earlier. But, mm -hmm. but it was after he began to publish motivational material mm -hmm. that he uh, began to promote Think and Grow Rich, and then that's when Think and Grow Rich exploded. Yeah, in terms I think Nightingale really. Conan produced that Think and Grow Rich book by Napoleon Hill. Lovely man. Say what? The audio. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. The audio book is fabulous. By, you know, the book by Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, and she did produce that. I thought I, I was laughing. But... Um, no, Dan was just a great guy, and he loved interesting people. He loved talking to people that were thinkers a great deal. And they were they would come over to help. But, you know, I was so young. I got used to seeing people. I'd say, ah, and then I'd just go and do my own thing. So, you know, I'd say it's a pleasure to make her, to meet you, make her acquaintance. And then David and I would just go upstairs. <laughs> okay, you were young. What, what did your father do? in uh, in the morning ritual. Was there a particular morning ritual that you felt made him successful? Well, I think the main thing is that after he would go downstairs and have breakfast, he would get dressed and he always had a pocket here and he would always put a little, well, it was not thin, it was a pad, notepad and his, and his mom blank would go in this pocket so that he could write down ideas on the way to work, you know, because the office was about 40 minutes away. And so when he was in the back, you know, being driven there, he would write down ideas before he got there. <laughs> That's great. He was great about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, because you lived with him and, and saw his success over the years, it must have been extraordinary to, to really witness somebody of his stature, um, mm -hmm. and and probably I know you you were you said you were pretty young at the time, but really now looking back, um, one you know we all study Earl Nightingale's quotes, and uh, he, Anne says that her favorite quote that's attributed to your dad is, "When you judge others, you do not define them; you define yourself." Yeah. Please tell us your interpretation of that quote for for us he thought judging other people was bad because you're only seeing the cover of the book not the book itself that is open to the true person and he thought that was very wrong very wrong to do that and uh, my father did wasn't that now he never really would bad mouth people ever to me at least um no, he would, he would have to, if he wanted to know someone, he would have to interview them and know them in depth before anything else. You know. mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. And he did not believe in hearsay either. People bad mouthing someone to bad mouth them. That's just wrong to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I do know that he was a wonderful radio uh, announcer and being very much a, a part of the journalist industry he mm -hmm. always i remember he always had his facts straight and he you know he like you said he, there, there was no hearsay about it no um so i always respected that ab about him i have an interesting question now change the topic just a little bit over to earl nightingale's health you had mentioned um and this is a, a question by 
Dr. Karen. Thanks, Dr. Karen. Um, she says, you spoke earlier about your father's health condition and his unexpected early death. Um, what do you think that attributed to his death since we all know that it's not a lack of positive thinking? No, he had, he had acromegaly. Um, he, he had acromegaly when I was 17, so he was probably around early 40s then. Um, I was in my first year of college. No, I was 18 or 19. So and he had that his whole life, really. Yes, and they removed a, tumor, a benign tumor off his pituitary gland that was the size of an alcohol. But the, because he had acromegaly, which is giantism, his body would always would always continue to release growth hormone, and so he had to have hip replacement, shoulder replacement, heart valve replacement. And um, the older he got, it became more difficult for him to walk because of his weight, body weight. His bone mass was much more dense and larger than ours. His heart was bigger. And so he slowed down a great deal. And then he went in for a new valve for his heart surgery. And afterwards, he had some serious problems and passed away. Mm -hmm. Oh, bless, bless his soul. You know, we're having a tribute here to him. Here it is, um, a special weekend. And we're, we're paying special tributes to uh, fathers from... Of, all over the world. And we, so we shout out to Earl Nightingale as a special father to all of us in terms of positive thinking and the impact that he's had on all of us. Um, and I'm so excited that you have just written a book, mm -hmm. uh, Pamela. So congratulations for that. Let me show everybody the, let me show everybody this audio book um, right here. You can go to. Here's the. Here's the QR code that you can go to in the Amazon. Um, and you can just put your camera up right now. I'll leave it up for just a second here. That you can take a picture of this QR code and go right to the, the link, the special link in Amazon um, that you can get the, the audio book. Oh, there it is. You, you're hel holding it up as well. Excellent. Okay. that great? Yes, it is. Congratulations. Thank and you. I, this is the audio book that uh, is just being released. And then your the actual printed book will be coming later in the year. But we're excited. Okay. I love it because uh, the audio book is so filled full of animation. And of course, the voices and the voice of of uh, Earl Nightingale is is obviously, you know, impactful. And so it's 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 pretty exciting. Okay. Let me just double check the um Q and A, and see if there are any more questions that have that have come up. Any other questions that our yes. audience would like to ask Pamela? Now's the time to do so. And add it to the uh, to the Q and A. Um, Daddy should be alive. What about? I have a question for you. When you decided to write this book and and have it uh, made into an audio book first, and then of course. It'll be published. And it, by the way, it's being published by Nightingale Conant Corporation. Thank you very much, right? <laughs> so how does it feel to be a first-time author? And how does it feel to carry the message of your famous father? Well, carrying the message was great, but I would like to point out it was a joint effort. I didn't do it alone. I had family to help me. My first cousin and my second cousin helped me a great deal. Okay. I mean, Victor Corbin and Andrew Lamoon helped me a great deal. I'd like to give them credit too, because they, without them, I don't think the book would be here today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. we effort. I mean, really, and it was it. It became a reality during the pandemic when the pandemic hit. I mean, really, what else could you do? You got to stay home. You might have right. done something positive. So we did. We worked. I on think I think it's a beautiful legacy, uh, something to come po positive to come out of the pandemic um, mm -hmm. and that you had an opportunity to focus on creating, creating something. Yeah, of, Andrew Lamoon of, actually took the book and really jump started from day one. She was the one that got me going on it and Victor, her father, too. 
Bridge recording and Bill Moon. They helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, That's we, it. We give thanks to them. Thank um, you. One last question I think I have here from Rochelle. Please ask Pamela how her dad would have addressed would have addressed this issue. I'm sorry, Rochelle. Um, or if you could just summarize the issue for me real quick, um, Rochelle, in, in maybe two sentences, I can re, uh, re ask that question. I know that it was something about positive thinking. Um, yes. So I, I think a family member of Rochelle's uh, speaks negatively all the time, and she's tried to help that family member, Rochelle has. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for Rochelle being a, a student of positive thinking for yourself? Um, she says that her, her daughter lacks self-esteem. And oh, you know, well, that's what mm -hmm. young people do today. I did at that age too. Um, I think the best thing they could do would be to, or uh, if they're adults, maybe listen to the stranger's secret. That would help because it really gets me going. But they have to understand one thing. Positive attitude equals positive results. Negative attitude will always equal negative results. But if they suffer from something like depression, bipolar, some mental illness that's being treated, I don't think I should give advice. I'm not a doctor. You know what I mean? But if they're, I don't know how to advise someone, but I would say stranger secret really gets me going. No, me too. <laughs> that's why. That's why we're here. You know. I listen to that. Before we recorded this, Pamela, I watch. I listened to the the strangest secret again, probably three different times. Um, once yesterday and once again this morning. I feel different. So there's something amazing in not just the strangest secret and not, let's just take lock, talk about this. That strangest secret was the first record of the written word that, uh, the spoken word, sorry, the spoken yeah, word gold. that went gold, mm -hmm. a million copies in, in that's like going crazy viral. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's there's something to that. Positive yes, thinking yes. creates positive results. Mm -hmm. And so we're just at the top of the hour here and I, and I wanted to acknowledge everybody who's been here yeah. with us today and sharing this opportunity and meeting with Pam and bringing your questions. I truly appreciate it. Pam, oh, is there anything you. final that you'd like to share with our, with our audience? Well, I just hope that people are, will go buy the, buy the audio book and enjoy it. That's what I'm hoping is that this will, it's a story about my dad. It really is from the very beginning to his untimely demise. But um, I hope people really like it and they enjoy listening to it. Thank you. Thank you. So, again, the story of Earl Nightingale and his strangest secret, as mm -hmm. told by his daughter, Pamela Nightingale. Plus, you had all of the stories that are, mm -hmm. you know, the behind the scenes stories that make, mm -hmm. that make his life mm -hmm. and his personality come alive. Oh, yes. For Thank the rest you. of us. Thank you. Thank so you. I I'm so appreciate you your being with us today and congratulations Thank you for, for Thank you. a wonderful book, The Story. It was a joint effort, believe me. I'm sure it's, it was. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. So everyone, you must go to Amazon and pick up the audio book of The Story of Earl Nightingale. Uh, Thank you. By Pamela Nightingale. Thank you. Thank you.